Good afternoon, and welcome to day five of Energy Finance 2020 online. I'm Sandy Buchanan, Executive Director of the Institute for Energy Economics and Financial Analysis, coming to you today from Cleveland, Ohio. Our session today is entitled Headwinds for LNG, Cooling Markets, Warming Planet. Our moderator is Suzanne Matei. Suzanne is an energy policy analyst with IEFA and a former regional director for the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation. She's an attorney with over 30 years of experience in public interest law and policy. And now let me introduce Suzanne to get us started. Hello. I'm on standby. Hello, everyone, and welcome. Thank you, Sandy. Um, today, we're going to be talking about the rapidly changing conditions in the liquefied natural gas industry. We have two experts with us today, Bruce Robertson and Clark Williams Derry. Bruce Robertson comes to us from Australia. He is an energy finance analyst with IEFA, but he also has over 32 years experience as a fund manager and a professional investor. He's been very involved in the energy debates going on in Australia, and he will have some interesting comments for us today. Clark Williams Derry comes to us from Seattle. He also is an energy finance analyst with IEFA. He spent about 18 years as a director of energy finance and research director for the Sightline Institute, which is a sustainability think tank, highly respected. And he also served as a senior analyst for the Environmental Working Group. So we're going to start with presentations, then we will go to question and answer. And if you look at the side of your screen, you should see a chat box. It has three tabs. We'll only be working with the first two. The first tab is labeled chat, and that's actually a live discussion that you can have with other participants in this conference, sharing your comments and your reactions. Uh, the second tab is the marked questions, where you can type in a question you would like to have asked of either one or both of the participants. Let us know your preference. And you'll also be able to see other people's questions. You'll be able to actually vote on other people's questions if you see one that you think is particularly important that ought to be asked. You can click a thumbs up and that will boost it higher in the list. So let's get started. We're going to start with Bruce Robertson and then we'll hear from Clark Williams Derry. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Bruce Robertson. I'm the energy finance analysts for oil and gas and LNG. My talk today is global gas and LNG markets not too healthy because we are in a very interesting time at the moment and a lot of the themes I'm talking about today predate COVID and I think it's really important to make that point that most of what I'm saying today about the unhealthy state of gas and LNG markets globally predate the COVID crisis. All the COVID crisis did was to speed things up a bit. Uh, first of all, I'd just like to show you, this is a slide from S&P Global Platts, a very good source. Um, this, the, the scale on the two graphs, as you can see, is actually the same. And what it's telling you is that globally renewables uh, overwhelming fossil fuels and nuclear in the global electricity production sector. Uh, I think it's really important to note that nuclear is really not a thing globally in terms of new investment into the power system. And if we have a look, gas is not serving as a transition fuel. If you look back in 2001, gas new builds overwhelm those of coal. That's not true today. 
coal builds are actually higher today than they were in 2001. And overall, fossil fuels have been declining since about 2011. This is another way of looking at it, um, the global investment by technology. And I think it's really important to note that investment into wind is, is roughly twice that into gas or twice that of coal and investment into solar is, is even more. So what's happening in global gas markets? Um, globally, spot gas prices have collapsed, absolutely collapsed. Even at the beginning of the year, they were pretty low at $5.50 if we have a look at the Asian spot market. But since then, they've just fall, fallen in a heap. Recently out of Australia, we've seen a cargo of gas go up to Southeast Asia, a spot cargo, and that, that was sold at $1.75 an MMBTU, which is below the cost of production. If we have a look in Europe, we are also seeing spot prices go to just over $1.00. To give you some context, you know, European gas prices a few years ago were up in that sort of $12 to $15 range. Um, at a dollar, even, even people that are piping gas into Europe are losing money. This is just a quick flow chart to show you just who are the big players in global LNG. Australia and Qatar are the, the, the you know, vying for first and second place. The US is back in third place, but is rapidly expanding. And Clark will go into that in his talk on the US, because the US is probably one of the most interesting markets at present for gas and LNG with the dynamics of what's occurring there. And Clark really will cover off on that market. I'll, I'll sort of concentrate on the other areas of the world. If we have a look at Japan, it's still by far the largest ex importer of LNG, followed by China, who is rapidly growing as an importer of LNG. What has occurred in recent years has been massive expansion, uh, particularly in the US, Australia, and Australia of, of their LNG industries. Uh, what we're seeing at the moment is that there's been massive overbuilding of LNG plants. Um, this had occurred prior to coronavirus and coronavirus is just, the coronavirus induced demand slump has just extended that gas glut out to 2028 to 2030, depending on the speed of recovery really. Um, you know, we will see non-economic subsidies extend the global gas glut. In, in May 2020, um, the US Exim Bank approved a 4.7 billion loan for Total's Mozambique LNG project. So for a French company developing a project in Mozambique, the US Export Import Bank gave them a massive subsidized loan uh, because they were gonna be buying some US equipment. So, um, those sort of soft loans will extend the glut. The other thing that really is going to extend the glut is the expansion that is probably going to occur in Qatar's LNG industry. Qatar is the world's largest exporter of LNG. And why would they be expanding into this massive gas glut? Well, there's a very good reason. And the very good reason is, is that uh, they have the north field, which is um, cut in half by a geographic boundary between them and Iran. And Iran have decided they're going to, to um, develop their half of the field. And what that means is that, that, that Qatar have decided they really have to develop their half, otherwise they'll miss out on the gas altogether. Uh, finally, just um, Japan is the world's second largest import of LNG, and its imports were down 8.8% in May, uh, which is the lowest level seen since May 2010. Uh, that's a pretty large fall for the biggest market in LNG, even though, um, you know, obviously there is coronavirus going on. Australian companies really aren't too healthy at the moment with the low oil prices that we've been seeing. There is a delay uh, because the way the pricing works, uh, it's a three-month delay. 
However, we are seeing those, those come through now, those low oil prices are feeding in because oil sets the price for gas in LNG markets globally. There are two systems for, for pricing LNG. Out of the US, it's based on the Henry Hub, which is a US Henry spot price, short-term price. Globally, most gas contracts are set with regards to oil. And so it's just a straight percentage of the oil price. Investment in LNG and gas has all but ceased. You know, in Australia, we're seeing massive pullbacks in investment. Woodside has, has pulled back from its giant Northwest Shelf project where it was looking to spend about $50 billion developing it. We've seen Santos pull out of their Barossa project in off the Northern Territory, which is a development of a big new gas field. And capital expenditure budgets have been cut across the board in Australia, as they have in the US and as they have globally, with the possible exception of Qatar. Look, Australia is a very high cost producer and will be particularly hard hit, especially the east coast of Australia, which is um, uh, the coal seam gas to LNG industry. The west coast is far more competitive, but the east coast, as you can see here, about 18% of its production is at risk at current pricing. Uh, look, I really wanted to talk a bit about emissions because emissions are going to be increasingly important. Um, I recently wrote a report, um, is the gas industry facing its Volkswagen moment? Because Volkswagen lied about its emissions and guess what? So is the gas industry. Methane emissions are growing very strongly as we can see in this curve from NOAA, the US people that are charged with looking at these things. And um, what it's showing is, is that the, you know, the, the graph is essentially straight up. Methane emissions from fossil gas have been underestimated by between 25 and 40%. It's really important to note that the gas industry always quotes that, that it's so much better than coal. And it's only better when you actually burn it. The actual burning process, it is better than coal for greenhouse gases, but nowhere near as good as they say. And it's nowhere near as good as they say because in the renewables friendly peaking plants, gas peaking plants um, are far less efficient than, than, than the baseload plants. Uh, they're only about 31% better than coal before leakages. And that's according to the gas industry itself. However, if gas leaks, if you only get 2 to 3% gas leakages um, of methane, it's worse for the climate than coal. And BP has stated that they believe the industry generally leaks at about 3.2%. So BP is saying that gas is worse than coal for greenhouse gases. Uh, recently, we've seen uh, a lot of greenhouse gas satellites go up and they can actually measure the amount of methane coming from a specific area. And that's just been done, literally just been done. And the emissions that come out of the Permian Basin, which accounts for over 30% of US oil production, are around 3.7%. Uh, so gas is worse than, 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 than coal in the largest oil and gas producing region in the US. Uh, unfortunately, in Australia, good old Aussie gas doesn't smell, according to our own gas industry funded scientific organisation. Um, I don't really trust their numbers, to put it bluntly, but they will get found out this year as the greenhouse gas satellites go over Australian gas fields. So in summary, gas is not a transition fuel. It is not going to lower emissions for us. It does serve a purpose in the power system at present, um, but that will be a diminishing purpose as batteries technology improves. And that's the end of my talk. Thank you very much. <laughs>
My name is Clark Williams Derry, and I'm an analyst for IEFA based in Seattle. And I'll be talking today about the US LNG boom, which has been one of the most significant developments in the global gas industry over the past four to five years. At the beginning of 2016, there wasn't a single US LNG export terminal in the lower 48 states. Uh, now there are 20 different plants across six different sites in the U.S., and the U.S. has become the third largest LNG producer and exporter in the world with liquefaction capacity that stands just behind Qatar and Australia. Now, you can't understand the origins of this LNG boom without also understanding something about the gas industry itself. This chart shows gas production in the U.S., from 1930 through 2019. And the sharp rise over the past 10 to 15 years represents the fracking boom. This is the result of US companies exploiting previously inaccessible gas reservoirs underground trapped in shale. Uh, it's been a you know, phenomenal growth and the US is now the number one gas producer in the world. Now you might think that this kind of rapid growth actually corresponded to good financial health in the fracking sector. But that's actually not true. Fracking companies have struggled to become profitable, uh, and this next chart helps explain why. Basically, fracking has become the victim of its own success. These companies are very good at producing large quantities of gas, but that has flooded the U.S. market and brought prices down. The supply glut has caused prices to fall to levels where Many gas companies simply can't make a profit from selling their, ga their gas on the market. So what does an industry do when it is oversupplied, when there's too much supply? Well, one thing it can do is it can try to find new markets. And that's really what the LNG boom in the U.S. is all about, trying to find new markets for the oversupply of U.S. gas. This chart shows gas consumption by U.S. LNG terminals, basically gas exports um, from the U.S. And as you can see, uh, the, the growth has been steady and, and rapid. And as of early January uh, in 2020, the U.S. LNG industry was consuming about 8% of all gas produced in the U.S. Now, the goal behind this growth in U.S. LNG exports, well, there really there are two goals. The first is to take advantage of higher prices in European and Asian markets. That is, you buy gas for low prices in the U.S., and then you sell it at higher prices overseas. And even though it costs a lot of money to liquefy the natural gas and ship it overseas, you can still make a profit if prices overseas are high enough. But there's a second point to the U.S. LNG boom that often gets missed in discussions of LNG. And that is that the LNG boom in part was designed to alleviate the domestic supply glut, to get some of the, the, the surplus gas off the market to raise domestic prices. So there really there are two reasons. One is to profit from sales, LNG sales directly. And the other is to um, is, is to raise prices domestically so that domestic consumers are paying a higher price for gas. Now, this growth is really just the tip of the iceberg. If the U.S. LNG industry has its way, there'll be more than a dozen additional plants built uh, mostly in the Gulf Coast over the next uh, 10 to 15 years. Uh, there, a lot of these projects haven't started yet, but some of them have. Uh, but many of them have been approved for construction by the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. Uh, but you haven't, haven't begun construction yet. Now, the thing is, though, that this planned build-out is now facing some severe financial obstacles that weren't even really conceivable at the time when the LNG boom started. And, you know, this chart shows what, really what's going on. This is a chart of spot prices for LNG in Japan. And you could show similar prices or similar charts for Europe and other parts of Asia. But the, really the point is that as the LNG boom has grown, and not just in the US, but globally, LNG prices have fallen. And really it's very similar to the dynamic we've seen in the US gas industry, where there's just too much supply, not enough demand, and that has forced prices to fall in order for the market to clear. 
So, you know, at the beginning of, uh, of 2018, we saw LNG prices in, in Japan north of $10 per MMBTU. Now it's closer to $2 per MMBTU. And in fact, in Europe, it's fallen below $2. And it's actually just not profitable at all to ship LNG from the U.S. to Europe. Um, it's just, you know, there's no way you can make a profit when the, the, the prices in Europe are, are lower than the prices in the U.S. So what has this meant for the gas industry and the, the plans for a major build-out in the U.S.? Well, in, at least over the past several months, the news has just been dismal. LNG has earned the reputation as the, the world's worst performing energy commodity. And this is developing before the coronavirus crisis hit. And it's just accelerated after coronavirus has de reduced demand in, in Europe and Asia. You know, it, it's surprising. LNG is now the worst performing commodity. It's worse than oil, worse than coal. Uh, and a lot of that, of that market turmoil is actually hitting the United States and the U.S. LNG pr uh, producers. Uh, many cargoes have been canceled. The U.S. has, been, has seen a, a sharp decline in deliveries of gas to the LNG terminals because the buyers just don't want it. Uh, and of course, we're also seeing delays, 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 projects in the U.S. that are being delayed because uh, the, the, it's harder to get financing for them, frankly. Uh, it's very hard to, to move forward with a project when the buyers aren't showing up. Now, how is this all affecting the, uh, the LNG companies? Well, it's actually kind of co a complicated story. As this chart shows, the uh, fracking companies have done very, very poorly this year. Uh, as of the time this chart was made, the fracking companies were down 40%. Their stock prices were down 40%. But Chenier Energy Partners, which is one of the nation's largest LNG exporters, uh, is actually held its value fairly well compared to the broader market. Now, how is this even possible? If Chenier is an LNG producer, and LNG is the, one of the worst performing commodities in the world, how is it possible that it's held its value? Well, the, the key to Chenier's sort of relative financial success it was that they locked themselves into long-term supply contracts before the coronavirus hit, years ago, when these projects were just being developed. And those those contracts actually force buyers to purchase LNG, or at least pay for LNG, even if they never take delivery of it. So Chenier Energy Partners has not seen a huge revenue hit as a result of the, uh, of the coronavirus and the, the cargo cancellations. Even if it's not shipping LNG, it is still getting revenue from those contracts. Now, what does this mean going forward? What are the prospects for this global LNG build-out, and for the U.S. in particular? Well, it's looking very grim right now. At least for the, for the time being, the global supply, supply glut is discouraging buyers from signing new contracts with LNG, with LNG companies. Uh, as we've seen in the U.S., it's actually true around the globe. These projects are being delayed because it's been very hard to sign up new buyers. Uh, for U.S. LNG companies, you know, for many of them, they had planned on at least some spot sales. A spot sale is a, a short-term contract or a one cargo at a time contract um, rather than a long-term contract. And a, a portion of, of, uh, of LNG companies' revenue comes from these spot sales. But those revenues have collapsed, and those have actually put some pressure on the, um, on the stock prices and on the financial viability of, of the existing LNG companies. In the coming years, LNG companies are going to be facing a series of very tough choices about what to do with their constrained revenues. Should they pay money in dividends to their shareholders, or should they use any, uh, any profits to retire their debt? This is a tough choice because if they don't pay their shareholders, they're going to you know, they'll, they'll face a, a tough time in the stock market. But if they don't retire their debt, they could be setting themselves up for long-term troubles uh, in, in a decade or so when their contracts start to expire. And there's one more risk that I want to point out for the U.S. LNG industry, which is that, well, if the, if the LNG industry actually has, you know, is successful in building out and continuing to build capacity here in the U.S., it could actually have effects on the U.S. market and make 
uh, make domestic gas more expensive. So it's possible that the US LNG industry could be facing higher feedstock costs, higher costs for, for gas um, in the future. And so I, I think that sort of couples with the troubles that the, the fracking companies are having in, in financial markets right now. If drilling doesn't keep pace with the demand for LNG from these uh, LNG plants, or the demand for gas from these LNG plants, you could see higher gas prices. And that could be a problem for U.S. companies who are trying to seek new contracts. So in sum, the U.S. LNG industry has gone through a boom over the past four to five years. But it now faces new threats, new risks that seemed inconceivable at the time that the boom started. Thank you, Bruce and Clark, for your excellent presentations. We're going to go to questions now. And we're going to start with a question from Brindis Woods of Arlington, Massachusetts, who is asking, what would you say to someone who wants to invest in gas now? Huh. And well, oh, yes. can I just jump in Go there? Ahead, so I guess my question, first question would be, what's your appetite? What's the investor's appetite for risk? Because uh, right now, this is an incredibly risky business, top to bottom, whether you're looking at the production side, midstream, downstream, or sort of semi-midstream, downstream, like LNG, uh, there's just a lot of risk. And a lot of that risk comes from, um, from some uncertain demand trends, from cost competition for re renewables, uh, and, uh, and, and frankly, sort of uh, you know, the demand side we're seeing on, um, you know, on, in globally and in the U.S., it's just not growing the way. Uh, the industry had hoped it would. So we're in a condition of oversupply and glut everywhere. So if you're trying to, you know, essentially invest into an already glutted market, you're going to be taking a big risk. So this is not the sort of thing where I would say, oh yeah, just go ahead and put money in gas. It'll be fine. It's definitely a high risk endeavor and you have to know exactly what you're doing, what, what projects you're looking at in, in order to make any, any, you know, informed judgment whatsoever. This is not the sort of thing that a generalist investor could even hope to touch and, uh, and make any money. I think that, you know, as a, as a general matter, I just think that gas, along with many other fossil fuels, is an incredibly risky business with a very poor track record over the last five years. I think it's, uh, it's, it's you know, I would, my advice would be, you know, think carefully. Mm -hmm. uh, Bruce, do you have something to add? Yeah, look, I think it's really interesting. Um, look, looking at what's happened in Australia recently, um, which is a strange place to look when you're talking about um, investing in the US gas industry, but the Australian energy regulator, the chair of the Australian energy regulator recently stated uh, when she was talking about uh, pipeline infrastructure in Australia, and she was saying that it had a limited economic life if it, they couldn't convert it to hydrogen. And so, so what it's really saying is, is that fossil gas really does have this limited life and uh, the risk of stranded assets. In other words, assets that won't see out their economic life is very high. Now, that increases your risk massively as an investor. If your asset in, in a seemingly dull, boring business like pipelines doesn't see out its economic life, it throws out the entire economics for that pipeline. I see. Okay. Well, that's a um, very, very interesting uh, perspective. I wanted to raise another question uh, that comes to us from Alex Wilkes at the Sunrise Project. And he mentions the question of whether anyone has looked into um, suing a key gas industry player for lying about their uh, greenhouse gas emissions or you know, under false marketing laws or whatever. And in that same context, uh, I would mention that Meredith Wingate of the Energy Foundation commented about the use of the term fossil gas as opposed to natural gas and what, what that communicates to people. Do you think that, that you could respond to both of those? Yeah, I, I recently wrote a report, is the gas industry facing its Volkswagen moment, which, which um, <laughs> and it referred actually to Volkswagen, who was sued for this, uh, for lying about its emissions in diesel cars. Um, 
Look, uh, I think in the very litigious US, um, you will undoubtedly see lawsuits about this. Um, it, it's been very clear and unequivocal that they have been lying about their emissions for many years, and it's a knowing lie. They actually know that they're lying. And I think that um, basically you can only do that for so long in the US before some smarty pants lawyer gets hold of you, and that's going to happen. Okay. Yeah, just just to add, I mean, the, the question in my mind might be under what statute somebody would be suing. Is it a, is it a false false advertising claim? Is it um, is it a shareholder suit uh, about sort of lying to investors and uh, different outcomes and different odds of, of success on each in each pathway? I'm not an attorney, so I you know I can't sort of handicap any of that. But there, you know, I think that the, this is one of the many things that people are looking at as they're moving forward towards the sort of the fossil fuel end game. Um, you know, who has misstated the impacts of their business in a material way that in a way that may have misled investors? It, it, it could be very easily be a securities type suit, as you're saying. I mean, when you look at it, um, the EU is looking at in, uh, bringing in carbon tariffs soon. And so therefore, the amount of carbon that your product actually produces is, is very material in terms of financial risk. And so, uh, you know, it, it, it could be as basic a thing as, you know, someone files a suit for a bond or, you know, a, 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 an application to, to, for an IPO for a bond, uh, for example. Okay. All right. I want to put two questions together um, because there's kind of a relationship between the two of them. Um, Lauren Stockman of uh, Oil Change International is... Uh, noting that uh, people are very bullish on the future of LNG demand growth in India, um, thinking that the glut will ease uh, due to rising demand in South and Southeast Asia. Are they being too optimistic? And then Nicholas Cunningham, who's a journalist, is asking uh, if drillers need higher prices to be profitable and more gas diverted to exports pushes up those prices and domestic gas rises, will that then hasten an energy transition as renewables are even more competitive with gas if the gas prices rise? Right. So this is, um, those are, those two questions yes. are closely linked because they're linked, they're really linked through price. Um, yes. You know, the, the, the when you hear predictions of rapid demand growth for gas overseas, for gas in Southeast Asia in particular, or in China, uh, a lot of that is, you know, basically premised on the idea that LNG is going to be cheap, that you're going to be able to get the LNG out of the ground, liquefy it, get it over there, and cheap enough to for, for the results to compete with existing energy sources. So the problem you're going to face in the United States is that in order to, you know, as, as Nick's question sort of hints at, you know, gas prices could rise and there's reasons to believe that they may spike and be become more volatile because LNG in the U.S. may be taking a larger and larger share of the, of the of total demand. Um, and that could in sometimes cause con some constraints. It causes price to strike, prices to spike. Um, maybe not as high as we're used to, like maybe not to the $7 range, but, but it could be, you know, significant. Um, you know, we, we started to take a look at, at the, some of the constraints in China, for example, uh, and the, the prices that Chinese buyers would need to be able to secure in order to justify economically ramping up LNG purchases versus, say, pipeline gas purchases from Central Asia. Um, and really, the U.S. is going to have to price in its natural gas probably at un under $7 per MMBTU over the long haul in order to, to, to see a significant uptake in Chinese purchases from the U.S. Uh, you, know, you may see some, some modest purchases when spot prices are lower, but you know, really, if, you, if you're sort of looking for a build-out that's premised on Asian demand, you're going to have to see prices low enough for Asian buyers to want to buy. 
Um, and that's a tough thing for, in the U.S. because you've got these fixed contracts that have you know $3 per MMBTU liquefaction fees. You've got about a dollar for transportation. You've got about you know somewhere between two and four dollars for the, your supply, depends on what the, the price in, in the U.S. is. And then you've got a dollar regasification cost on the other side, plus some pipeline costs. So once you get to the city gate in China, you may not be able to make a profit by importing U.S. gas into China. And I think we're going to find some of the same kinds of infrastructure and price constraints in Southeast Asia. Um, you know, I think there's a, there's a lot of, you know, a lot of belief in the demand, but the question really is the demand at what price? And is it, is it a price that can guarantee the kind of profits that U.S. LNG companies were, you know, basically were going to rely on? I, I really think that the, the, the whole industry is in a bit of a cleft stick here. Um, when you look at it, um, the, the questioner asked specifically about India, for example. As Clark was saying, um, a lot of these markets are extraordinarily price sensitive. So you will see more demand for gas at these low levels out of India. There is no doubt in my mind. But as soon as the price rises, the demand will evaporate. In addition to which, you've got to remember we're in a situation now globally where renewables are continuing fall in price and that fall in price is just going to put enormous pressure on the upper level for gas that seven dollars an mmbtu that that, that that clark was talking about that will keep coming down over time because renewables are just becoming so much more competitive and are overwhelming the new fossil fuel builds in new electricity for example um, globally so so this you have this tremendous, you know, downward pressure on gas prices, yet they need to make more money than they make now because the industry is simply financially unsustainable at, 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 at these levels. Right. I mean, that's, I think that's the perfect way of thinking about it because, you know, prices have to go up. The more prices go up, the harder it is for that demand scenario that people are, are envisioning for LNG and for gas in general. How, how's that going to materialize? When there, are, when there are cheap alternatives and, available. And pr prices have to go up a lot. I mean, in, in the US, you are facing quite a, a, a very significant fall in production coming up. You only have to look at the rig count, the Baker Riggs, uh, Baker Hughes rig count in the US, which is down 73% from a year ago. The number of operating drill rigs drilling for this stuff is down 73%. Mm -hmm. You will see a very large decline in, in, in production, which will spike the price in my view. I think you will get quite a significant spike coming into next year, the end back half of next year. Yeah, um, I, I think that's a very, you know, it's a real potential. Uh, and it's especially real potential if global LNG prices spike for whatever reason. Um, and you, know, you wind up with up to 10% of the demand in, of, of US production, maybe more depending on what, what the actual absolute level of production is just going to feed, you know, LNG plants that have come online over the past four or five years. Yeah. The, the, the years of low gas prices in the U S I think are, are very, very limited. And, and if you're a new um, power station developer in the U S and you go for gas, um, I, I think you're going to do your money. It's a big risk. It's a big risk. You know, of course I hate making pr predictions about prices because that's a great way to be wrong. Uh, yeah. But, but, you know, I think that there's the, I could, I, the way I put it is there's a lot of price risk right now that maybe um, uh, maybe is sort of underappreciated in, in the more optimistic se segments of the of the gas market. Now we had a question from a student, uh, PhD student Syed Mohammed, asking about the situation in Qatar, where they recently expanded their LNG production and um, put a lot more into LNG shipping, and is that a was that a wise move for Qatar? And what do we see as, as the future there? Bruce, is that one that you could talk to a little bit? Yeah, yeah, certainly. Look, I, I, think, it's, I think it's highly likely that, that Qatar will actually see um, a, a significant expansion, even despite the fact we've got this global gas glut. I mean, they, they really are being forced into, the timing for them is being forced by the fact that the Iranians are developing the other half of the field and um, in all likelihood, um, 
you will see that investment go ahead into a glut, which obviously is going to massively extend the glut because it's a big <laughs> development. It's 25 million tonnes. It's, 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 it's a big deal, the, 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 the scale of that development. So, um, you know, um, yeah, I, 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 think, I think it will go ahead. Um, they've, all they've got to do is find a customer, and that will be hard to find a customer at a reasonable price. But Qatar, um, everyone should understand Qatar is the low-cost producer globally. Uh, that's why it's always been the biggest, because it can produce this stuff at a very, very, very low price. Um, so it'll be the last man standing in any price war. Um, I can assure you they'll be the last man standing, or woman standing, I should say. Right. And just to... Uh to put some color on this supply glut in the U United States right now, there's about 39 million tons per year of capacity that's already under construction. Uh, it's th things that maybe open, some of it opens this year, some of it opens next year, some of it doesn't open until 2025. Uh, but so there's still going to be, you know, a fair amount of new capacity in the U S and then if you look at Canada, LNG Canada is going to add some more. And then there's been some final investment decisions in, you know, in, Mozambique and elsewhere. So, I mean, it, you know, Qatar is just going to be adding to a, 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 a significant amount of new supply. And the question about is, it, you know, that's, that's almost a given that that new supply is coming online. The question is really going to be, what's the demand picture going to be like and how is it, how the price is going to fare? Um, and, you know, are the people who have already committed to these projects, are they, are they going to take a bath? Are they, are some of them just either the buyers of the LNG or the companies themselves, are they going to have a really hard time um, you know, start looking like kind of the U.S. fracking sector, which has just been a financial disaster over the past few years. Now, we had a question from uh, Lisa Fisher, who's an energy reporter, asking about how you evaluate the disruption risks on the demand side for gas use in heating and in heavy industry. And what, what do you see happening on the demand side um, for gas in heavy industry? Uh, I, I can come in here. I think I think when you um when you look um strangely enough, Australia is actually a very high cost gas country to buy gas in. <laughs> it's, it's unbelievable, I know, but there's a whole heap of reasons why. But um, anyway, it's a very high cost country to buy gas in, and we're already seeing it here in Australia. What you're seeing is the residential sector, which is um you know a pretty large part of the um, global gas market. Uh, we're seeing it's cheaper to heat your home in Australia with a reverse cycle air conditioner. It's cheaper to heat your hot water with a heat pump. It's cheaper to cook with um, induction cooking, which gives you instant heat like gas does. So people in Australia are beginning to switch out of gas just naturally. Um, that is already occurring. We're also seeing industry in Australia looking to renewables where they can. There are some high heat applications where it's still very difficult to switch away from gas, but there are a number now that you can economically do it. And they are, it is occurring already in, in heavy industry and even lighter commercial industry. It is actually already occurring that switch out of gas. Um, and it will continue for as long as prices in Australia remain ridiculously high, which they are. Yeah. So that's the sort of future that will happen. A bit, a fair bit of this, you know, is it worth switching or not, is really dependent on the gas price that we we're talking about earlier. Yeah. It's always risky to, to predict <laughs> that. Yeah, we sound like a broken record. Gas price, gas price, gas price. I mean, looking at what's happening in China in terms of heavy industry, um, I don't know the situation. You know, in, in terms of the technologies and the and I've seen a bunch of projections. For, of course, you see projections. Every projection is it's going to grow, it's going to grow. But you know, the the what I look at is again the price and the city gate price for industrial consumers is somewhere around seven to eight dollars per MMBTU in China. Uh, that's going to you know, you know potential and that that includes you know the, that that city gate price doesn't even cover the cost of importing LNG and in some cases doesn't even cover the cost of importing pipeline gas. So that's a, a city gate price that works for the gas industry as a whole, mostly for China's domestic gas 
industry, but it doesn't necessarily right now leave much room for, and we said for the long haul, for, for U.S. exporters uh, and other international exporters to make much of a profit. Um, and so, you know, you have a $7 per MMBTU price, at least in uh, CityGate price in China. Uh, and so what are you going to do? Are you, are you competing against other parts of the world, like in the U.S., where you know, the, the natural gas price will be like, like just a fraction of that. And of course, you've got labor costs and other things as well. But the point being that, you know, as Bruce says, you know, don't, you know, price is a very, very important p- part of this picture. The price of natural gas, the price of, price of fossil gas and the price of LNG in particular, um, you know, can be, you know, the costs are pretty high and the, and the price has to be high enough to justify those costs. Uh, and the price of renewables is coming down. And so I think that that's going to be the major thing to keep watching. These are technology trends. It's hard to predict the future of technology. Uh, but I think what we are seeing is that the cost of renewables keeps dropping. The number of ways of using electricity as a substitute for, for other, other fuels um, in industrial processes and in, you know, frankly in residential and commercial applications as well. You know, electricity prices keep, you know, renewable electricity prices keep falling. So, um, it's just a way of saying, you know, when you see a prediction for massive growth in any sector, you, the first question you should be asking yourself is, yeah, but at what price? Okay. Um, I want to jump over to a question from uh, Jason Disterhoft of the Rainforest App Action Network. And he was asking about given the climate impacts of fossil gas and especially LNG, that these are systematically underestimated um, and not priced in. Um, But the chickens are starting to come home to roost as as we've been talking about recently. Um, Does fossil gas face especially acute stranded asset risks, uh, particularly LNG infrastructure given how capital intensive it is. What do you think are going to really be the drivers behind the issue of stranded assets? <laughs> oh, well, I can give this one a go. Um, okay. uh, I bet you can. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, if, if, if we have a look, if we have a look at uh, LNG, just to give people an idea, it's an incredibly energy intensive process. Okay. About 9% of the gas, well, it is 9% of the gas that goes in gets burnt just to make the LNG. Shipping takes another 2 to 6% of the gas just to ship it. So when we talk about, when you talk about greenhouse gas implications, your question is dead right. LNG is incredibly vulnerable <laughs> because it's such an energy intensive process. Um, and, and really, um, a lot of these assets won't see out their natural life, you know, their economic life. Um, under current, uh, you know, if the global trend towards more climate policies uh, and, uh, you know, continues. We are seeing Europe looking at at bringing in a tariff, a a carbon tariff um, on nations that don't have carbon policies. Um, We are looking at um, nations, you know, more and more nations adopting carbon policies. So as that occurs over time, um, I, I think I think that uh, you know that the risk of stranded assets in LNG in particular um, increases. I just to put some U.S. color on this. Um, so right now in the U.S., because of the global decline in LNG demand, uh, U.S. LNG facilities are working are operating somewhere between twenty five and forty percent capacity. So. Uh, and ordinarily, ordinarily, that's around eighty-five to ninety percent. That's what what you see sort of globally in terms of capacity utilization. And the U.S. has borne the brunt. I think, as I mentioned in in, uh, in my my presentation, the U.S. has borne the brunt of some of these declines um, for for a variety of reasons having to do with contract structure. But uh, one way of thinking about this is that those assets are currently stranded. That they are, you know, they are the, the companies themselves are making money but they're not being used or utilized. And sometimes they, like, these, these plants are literally off, 100% off, um, you know, and you might have multiple trains at a single facility that are just, not, just sitting there. Uh, so one way of looking at this is this is already a stranded asset or is like at least temporarily acting like a stranded asset. Then you have to look sort of at the future. You've got 
pipelines coming on, and especially from Russia, that are going to be you know potentially supplying Europe and supplying China. Uh, and that gas is probably going to be a little bit cheaper. There are political reasons why China might want to choose Russian gas over U.S. gas. Uh, is it, you know, they share a border. Um, so, uh, so I, mean, I, I think that there's like plenty of reasons. If you sort of look at the, at the overlapping uh, sort of picture of risk for the LNG industry, I think that there is a, an elevated risk of of stranded assets in the LNG sector, but it's a little bit hard for me to compare that to the rest of the, of the, of the, of the fossil fuel sector. I mean, how does that compare with coal? That's also at risk. So is it, you know, what's the greatest, greatest stranded asset risk? Well, I mean, I mean, the, I think that that's a sort of a, maybe an academic question, but let's just say that there is a, there's a sizable stranded asset risk just for the LNG sector. Now, uh, Greg Atkin, raised a question about the role of sovereigns in propping up industry. And I was wondering if you might have any comments on that issue, the, the complex financing that can happen in countries when sovereigns are do, taking that kind of action. Well, the classic example is um, the US Exim Bank uh, recently has um, supported uh, total to build a plant um, in Mozambique. It, it, it sort of does my head in a bit. A French, <laughs> French company getting supported by the now. US Exim Bank, but they're going to build it. They're going to buy a whole lot of US kit to, to to build this plant apparently, and apparently that's the reason to get a whole lot of sort of like change from from manufacturing to the US. But but nevertheless, um, that sort of cheap financing deal often. It is a thing that closes the deal for, for you know, for the mm -hmm. investors. And um, so, so they have a significant role, I would say, in propping up um, these investments. You know, in Australia, we have a government that, that is hell-bent on, on, on uh, subsidising the gas industry. And so uneconomic um, projects become economic. In, in, in essence, you know, the whole fracking of, of an entire state, um, which you know, we don't have many of in Australia, unlike the US, but of an entire territory called the Northern Territory, which is a very big area um, mm -hmm. and has a lot of gas in very remote places. Um, it, it is likely to get sponsored by the government to the tune of hundreds of millions of dollars directly in sponsorship and, and um, billions of dollars in soft loans. Um, that, that is likely to happen. So uh, states have a, a it, it, look, anything is economic with a state subsidy. Absolutely anything, you know, I can, I can produce LNG on the moon if you give me enough money. Um, and, and, and essentially that's what's going to happen with gas. A lot of these projects are going to go ahead because of state sponsored money and they shouldn't because, you know, they're, they're clearly cheaper alternatives. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I mean, agree with Bruce. Um, you know, you know the, the the issue with LNG is that is that we, we don't just see the projects, the LNG projects, receiving subsidies. You see pr production receiving subsidies. And so, in the U.S., you have you know a variety of hidden subsidies, things like the intangible drilling cost deduction and road building and and uh, and uh, those are sort of subsidi subsidies for like you know you, like companies don't necessarily have to set aside money to clean clean up after themselves, which is, a, which is a huge deal. These are all implicit subsidies that allow projects to move forward that maybe shouldn't, based on um, you know based on just the, the pure economics of things. So um, you know it's it's a you know subsidies are a pervasive problem across the you know the entire fossil fuel sector. Um, you know, people complain about renewables getting subsidies when sort of sort of ignoring the beam in your in your own eye um because the fossil fuel industry does to benefit you know and one of probably one of the biggest single subsidies that it receives is that it gets to use the atmosphere as a free dumping ground well, that's that's definitely a big issue for for everybody uh i think we're coming we're coming near to the close of our time um I wanted to just ask if there's any quick comment that you could make about the relationship between what's going on in natural gas in fossil gas and LNG and with petrochemical buildouts that have been going on. 
uh, if there's any comments you'd like to make about the relationship between what's happening in the, in the gas industry and various projects to build petrochemical manufacturing plants for plastics, et cetera. Uh, they, I think that they have similar fundamental dynamics. They're both, they're all premised on cheap gas, a continuation mm -hmm. of cheap gas. Uh, they are all in many cases subsidized one form or another. Um, and the, they're all uh, essentially um, playing to markets that are in glut that you know that there is actually an oversupply of petrochemicals and petrochemical manufacturing capacity globally just as there is at the moment an oversupply of lng capacity and has been for the past year or two um or at least you know basically in a full year uh and and so there's a um uh there there are, there are linkages but i'm not sure the, the another potential linkage is the is the is the potential and i see there's a comment um about sort of you know, whether or not the, there's really is good, going to be a u.s price spike and i you know i agree i think that there's like some there's uncertainty there there's absolutely uncertainty there but they're all sort of all those uncertainties are kind of linked together um you know as the as the um you know lng boom continues we will see continue to see sort of um you know potential for spiking gas prices we may see the potential for gas prices or for for um uh you know better economics for for some of the uh, uh for the for the some of the the uh the the petrochemical projects if there's um if if, if demand actually um demand rises. Anyway, so my point being that there are sort of like conceptual linkages, but I'm not sure that there's actually a direct linkage between the LNG industry that we're talking about today and the petrochemical industry that um, that is actually growing you know, separately. And as I guess we've talked about some other points in this in this conference. Yeah, I think we're going to have to wrap up pretty quick here. Okay. I'm sorry, Bruce. Um, but if you, uh, I want to thank both of you for your presentations and for this very vibrant discussion that we've just had. I'm going to have to turn us back over to Sandy Buchanan, but I wish we could talk for the rest of the day. Thank you so, so much for your time today. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Thanks to all of you, Bruce, uh, Suzanne and Clark. That was a terrific discussion and a special shout out to Bruce, who joined us at three o'clock in the morning in Australia. <laughs> um, we're so glad to have you all with us today. And if you'd like to keep the conversation going, you can do that a couple of ways through the chat. And also we have a live Twitter feed at hashtag AIFA2020. We also hope you'll stick around here for a few minutes and watch the next in our series of videos that we've prepared on the wonderful work being done to accelerate the energy transition in communities around the world. This week's video features the work being done by Cambio Puerto Rico, led by Ingrid Villa Biaggi. And we hope you'll be back here tomorrow, again at one o'clock, uh, for the session on petrochemicals, as we've just been talking about, where we'll talk about whether petrochemicals are the final frontier for fossil fuel survival. Thanks again, and goodbye. I'm Ingrid Vila. I'm an environmental engineer. So that's how I got into environmental issues. I actually studied environmental engineering. I have a bachelor's degree uh, in environmental engineering from Cornell University and a master's in environmental engineering uh, with specialty on water studies from Stanford University. I've served in government a couple of times. The most recent one, I served as chief of staff for the Commonwealth in 2013 and 2014. I had the pleasure of meeting Ingrid a number of years ago when she served as chief of staff in the governor's office in Puerto Rico, while I was serving as the regional administrator for the Environmental Protection Agency. Ingrid is one of the single most effective professionals I've ever had the privilege of working with. I worked very closely with her on trying to get support and resources to an economically struggling but absolutely beautiful community called Caño Martin Peña, where there was an effort to get people better housing and to dredge an old canal so that it could be ecologically restored and be a resource for the community. We, we didn't really call it climate change resiliency at the time, but that's exactly what it was. 
I also worked with Ingrid on trying to convince the U.S. military to clean up the Vieques firing range. For over 60 years, the beautiful tropical island of Vieques was used for military operations and practice ranges. The Department of Defense left behind a legacy of unexploded ordnance. It was a federal Superfund site that EPA was responsible to clean up. Having a partner in the governor's office to try to pick up the pace on that cleanup was really helpful. Right after I left government, I founded a non-for-profit organization in Puerto Rico called Cambio uh, to support communities and promote sustainable and responsible actions for Puerto Rico. We started Cambio in 2015. Our first project was supporting communities who were fighting against a waste incinerator that was being proposed for Arecibo, Puerto Rico. Communities were opposing this project, yet government was not paying attention uh, to their claims. So we came in and started supporting communities, working together with them. They wanted to build the incinerator of trash in Arecibo. And it was a struggle that we, it took us at least about almost 10 years. Ingrid has been a big help to us with all these other people, experts, scientists, doctors, and academic people, religious people. <laughs> We did a real good job educating the population to understand why we were against this incinerator because, you know, it, it contaminated and the health issues, the environmental issues. So we're ha very happy that we have prevailed. <laughs> After Hurricane Maria, the island was left entirely without power. A lot of sectors didn't get power back for up to a year. So we started focusing on energy um, and sustainable energy alternatives. Unfortunately, in 2018, right after the hurricane, the governor announced that he was going to transform the electric grid, but he was going to do so through privatization and through methods that would continue to pursue fossil fuel investments on the island. And that's how we came up with um, Queremos Sol, which is the shirt I'm wearing today. Queremos Sol, which is We Want Sun in English. It's a very diverse group with very many peoples from different organizations. We have the Electric Union from Puerto Rico as part of Queremos Sol. We have professors from the universities. We want to transform our electric system to use renewables, okay? We live in Puerto Rico. We live in the tropics. We've got sun all, all year. We're proposing a sustainable transition to 100% renewable energy using rooftop solar and battery storage, and also promoting a collective purchase alternative that will make it more feasible for communities to be able to acquire solar PV systems. The proposal would put more power to the people um, people would have ownership of the system. They would have control of consumption. So the consumer transitions to being someone who is active in the system, in the grid, in participating in decisions that are being made instead of just being a passive uh, customer. The damage and the shock that Hurricane Maria represented to the people of Puerto Rico suddenly opened the door for people to be receptive to alternatives, for people to start to think about what is the condition of our energy infrastructure and what is the most sensible solution to reduce vulnerability. We need to invest the infrastructure money on rooftops, solar, renewables. We keep insisting on that and we keep insisting that why it's important that no more fossil fuels in Puerto Rico, no more. And so people now are getting more interested in finding that I want to know about more about this Queremos Sol group. In terms of the coming year, I'm quite excited about developing this model for collective solar purchase on the island to see if we can actually develop something that will make it affordable for people to be able to acquire these systems. At the same time, I'm quite excited about a modeling work that we're doing actually along with AIFA that will detail what type of investments in infrastructures need to happen in order to get to 100% renewable using rooftop solar. And that is going to be a really powerful tool because when we are able to 
uh, demonstrate with modeling that this is something attainable, that this is something that can be done. I think it'll be really difficult for the power authority executives and those in charge in government to tell us that uh, this is something that cannot be done or is something that is too costly or something that um, could be considered maybe in the future, but not now. So when we finish this modeling work, I think we're going to be in an even better position to pursue our objectives in Queremos Sol. It's a no-brainer, and Puerto Rico will only transition to a clean energy future if the leadership comes from the residents of Puerto Rico, but the residents also need some technical expertise and some strategic support, and that's where Ingrid comes in. No one's better at this in Puerto Rico than Ingrid. I would argue no one's better than this in the country. Ingrid Vila is, you know, one of the most extraordinary people I have ever met. Um, I'm very proud of her. With her knowledge and her determination, you know, to do what's right and to help so many people, I think that we can do this now. 